Is that loud enough for you, Bob? Okay, good. All right, we're going to get started this evening, and uh, good to be back in the house of the Lord. Hopefully more people will come, and until they come, we're going to, uh, we're going to do, do a little bit of singing. Um, as, I, as I tell everybody, I make a joyful noise unto the Lord, so, uh, so you sing the words that are up there. Don't follow what I say, because my wife says I add a lot of words to everything as well. Um, and so you just sing, you just sing the songs, you know, um, I put them on PowerPoint last time we, uh, we did this, we, uh, didn't have anything on PowerPoint. We had to do it by memory and we did really poorly. So hopefully tonight we'll do a little bit better with just a few of us, but sing out as we, uh, sing unto the Lord tonight. Uh, but it's good to be back. It's good to have brother Rodney with us tonight as he will share from the word of God. I hope your heart was blessed this morning and I know mine was. And so uh, we had a great afternoon today as we fellowship together. And so uh, hopefully you will have a great evening tonight. But uh, let's, um, let's, let's start with a song. See if I can. I have to lead. And I... This is not the right one. Um, Tom, I have the wrong PowerPoint on there. Will you uh, see about, can you change that for me? See, I don't even do computers right, okay? Uh, while we're changing PowerPoints here tonight, uh, just a reminder, announcements, okay? Don't forget your sign. There's some more signs out there. Um, the, you know, I, I think everybody who wanted one probably took one, so if you want a second one, feel free to go ahead and take it, okay? We have, I think, probably about five more out there, maybe six more, seven more. So if you haven't grabbed one, make sure you do grab one. Uh, that would be great. Uh, that would be great. So, um, I, and then, uh, and then remember, we also uh, have a movie night coming up at the end of the month. Uh, make sure that's the fourth Thursday of the month, whatever date that is. I'm not sure exactly what date that is, the 29th. The 29th. Um, so, uh, make sure you mark your calendars. Uh, it's going to be a good evening as we fellowship together. Uh, we are just for everybody's information. I was talking with Pastor Russ tonight. Uh, we are starting Sunday school back up. I am. This is, I, I shouldn't say this, especially since it's going out live and it's going to be on YouTube and so on. I am so tired of the COVID-19. I am ready to say we need to get back to normal. Um, and so we're going to, uh, we're going to start our Sunday school back up. Um, I don't think it will be next week, but we will start it up uh, here in September and we will just run our normal. Um, I don't care what the Um, I put it on top with the other files. It should be right up top. The last one of all the other files. If, if, um, all right, I'm going to uh, ask John. John, why don't you come up here? John's our chairman of our board of deacons. Come up and, uh, and open us with a word of prayer, and I'll run back there and get the, um, there we go. Is that, that's it. We well, got it, Tom. Thank you. Uh, thanks. You're saved by the bell there, John. Um, let's, um, th th this is all on PowerPoint. Uh, this is all live, by the way. So um, we're looking like, like we're well organized here tonight. That was all my fault back on the computer. Uh, I apologize for that. Uh, you know, part of, uh, part of our prayer ought to be, Lord, revive us again. And uh, so uh, this is a, an older song. We should know it. Uh, let's sing that together, revive us again. next time shout out amen uh, we had a um, we had an evangelist one time this was years ago when I was younger um, at another church uh, the evangelist says we, we we don't say amen like like wimps we say it and we shout it out amen and so make sure you shout it out when we get to the course let's sing on the second we praise thee O God for thy spirit of light who has shown us our Savior and scattered our night. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. All glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain, who has bore all our sins and has cleansed every stain. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. 
And you know, as we, uh, as we know the Lord, the Word of God tells us uh, that uh, one day God's going to come, He's going to call us home, and uh, what a day that will be when we all get to heaven. Let's sing this one together as well. Let's, uh, let's open with a word of prayer. Oh, our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being here in your house and worshiping you. And Lord, we just pray that tonight you would just speak to our hearts and minister to our needs. Uh, Lord, be with those who uh, couldn't make it tonight. Be with those who um, should have made it tonight and chose not to. Uh, Lord, you just work in hearts in a mighty way. But Lord, for us who are here, just really challenge our hearts tonight. We do thank you in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Our last song tonight, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. While we're here on earth until Jesus takes us home, it is sweet to just trust in him day by day. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. All right, at this time, we're going to have our evangelist come back. Uh, Brother Rodney is going to come, share from the Word of God, and um, then he'll share whatever the Lord has laid upon your heart. Brother? Thanks, sir. Well, praise the Lord. Thank you for being back this evening and uh, looking forward to the night. We had a great uh, afternoon of fellowship uh, First over lunch with your pastor and your associate pastor and their wives and, and steak. And steak, that was the good part, right? And then uh, uh, went back to the pastor's house and uh, spent the afternoon uh, sharing fish stories or something. I don't know exactly what it all was, but, but uh, certainly appreciated the time and the fellowship. A real blessing for us, for sure. Uh, we enjoy it very, very much. So don't worry when, uh, 
you feel like the crowd is small and you're trying to sing because no matter what happens, if you don't think you sound good, you sound better than this boy that I once knew. And that boy was me. <laughs> when I was a kid, I went to camp uh, and I loved to sing. Never was a singer, but I loved to sing. And so, you know, we'd learn all kinds of songs at camp and, you know, it only takes a spark to get a fire going and uh, all of those songs. And I used to mow lawns. That's how I made money. And and somehow I had it in my mind that if the lawnmower was running, I could sing as loud as I wanted to and nobody could hear me. And I lived under this uh, fact uh, of, of mine for quite some time. And so I'd be mowing lawns and I would just sing at the top of my lungs, you know, uh, Tis so sweet, trust in Jesus. No doubt sang that song. I mean, I would just sing and thinking that I'm completely shielded. I can't hear them. They must not be able to hear me. And so one day I was out, I just finished mowing a lawn for a family in the church. I went out in the driveway and I'm hooking my lawnmower up to the back of my bicycle and the neighbor comes over and he goes, I sure like it when you come by to mow lawns. And I thought, what? And he goes, we just love listening to you sing. And I went, what? <laughs> so, uh, you know, you can't do worse. Just let her, let her rip, amen. Pretend like you're mowing the lawn and let her rip. Nobody can hear you, trust me, it works that way. I want you to open your Bibles tonight to the 113th Psalm, <clears throat> Psalms 113. And uh, I want to just spend some time in this psalm with you tonight. It really is a psalm that gives us tremendous uh, insight and instruction in the Word of God and also in its use. And so I'm going to read it together with you and then we'll just sort of dig in this evening. Psalms 113, verse 1, the Bible says this, Praise ye the Lord. Praise, O ye servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun unto the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. Who is like unto the Lord our God who dwelleth on high, who humbleth himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in the earth? He raiseth up the poor out of the dust and lifteth the needy out of the dunghill, that he may set him with princes, even with the princes of his people. He maketh the barren woman to keep house and to be a joyful mother of children. Praise ye the Lord. I have a word of prayer with you this evening. Father, thank you so much for our time and uh, Lord, just allowing us to read through this tremendous psalm together just now and uh, hearing over and again your instruction to us, just praise you, the Lord. God, I would acknowledge to you tonight as we begin to study this, this uh, chapter in this uh, book of Psalms, I would acknowledge that you alone are worthy of all of this praise. And I'm thankful for the God that you are, and I'm thankful for the call that you put on each of our lives, not just mine. I, I know, God, that there's things that you've called me to do for you, but every one of us here has got a mission and a and an opportunity for our lives to matter for eternity if we'll just serve you and walk with you the way you call us to. So Lord, help us to hear your call and help us to just give ourselves to you. And uh, Lord, be honored to hear tonight, I pray, as we, uh, as we just take a glimpse and maybe are able to pull back the veil into the Holy of Holies for a moment and, and just to see you as you are, Father. And Help us to, to see your worthiness of praise and to be in awe of you and to worship you and to, and to give ourselves to you because of who you are tonight. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The 113th Psalm is one of, uh, it's one of my favorite songs. I, I, had, I have honestly preached out of it a number of times and uh, I'd sort of set it uh, aside until recently as I was reading another passage of Scripture and realized the connection that's there, and I'll show it to you. It may not be super powerful to you, but it was, it was pretty amazing to me as we get to the end of this psalm. This, this is the beginning, the official beginning, of a group of psalms called the Hallel Psalms. Uh, these psalms, uh, beginning in 113 through 118, were songs that were uh, gathered together, and they were used 
at the great uh, feast. This morning we talked about some of the feasts just briefly. We looked a little bit more at the Feast of Tabernacles, which is the last feast in the Hebrew calendar. Uh, the first feast there is Passover, and, uh, and I did notice in your track rack tonight, I don't know if you noticed it, but you've got some tracks. I imagine that we either left them or sent them when we were here before, but you've got a track on Passover. That's a ways off. You've got a track on Purim. Who knows what Purim is? Anybody? Queen Elizabeth? Uh, no, no, Your Honor. Wait, let me curtsy. Uh, you're close, though. Yes, yes. Queen Elizabeth, wasn't she the one that burnt Christians? I don't know. I'm not sure if that's... <laughs> it was Queen Esther. It's the events of God uh, moving with, uh, in, in that time frame. Uh, you have some of those tracks out there. Uh, we can leave with you uh, some uh, Great Day of Atonement tracks, which is coming right up. But uh, so learn when those uh, holidays are and use those tracks to reach out to Jewish people. It's very important that, that you might do There are a lot of Jewish people who, who are sort of non-observant, who don't go to synagogue or do anything like that. However, they do out of tradition practice the holidays, okay? And so you have a great opportunity uh, with them around here if you'll know those and use those tracks that you have and we can certainly leave some others uh, with you tonight. But uh, uh, when these songs were sung at those great festivals, um, uh, the 113th Psalm was the primary psalm that was sung during the Passover festival uh, and that uh, celebration, if we call it that, or, or at least observance of the celebration. The 118th Psalm is one that was, and all of them I think would be sung ultimately, but the 118th Psalm was one that really focused on the Feast of Tabernacles and those, uh, those uh, ceremonies we talked about, the light libation ceremony and how it pictured what he'd uh, done, God had done, but also the coming of the Messiah and, and how he'd promised to save them. And that Psalm was one that was really used there. And so they're called Hallel Psalms, and they were used formally in those times of worship in the, in the feasts and celebrations that are there in the book of Leviticus and other places uh, by the, in the nation of Israel. Now, uh, the reason that they're called the Hallel Psalms, they're really called the Egyptian Hallel Psalms by commentators uh, because the second one talks about them coming out of Egypt. I don't really know so much about the idea that uh, whether they're Egyptian or not. But here's the reason they're called Hallel Psalms. And if you look at the 113th Psalm where we started, it's in the first phrase. And the first phrase there is this phrase, Praise ye the Lord. Now, Praise ye the Lord there uh, is really... Oh, <coughs> Uh, one, uh, two, but really they're sort of all run together as one word in the Hebrew. Uh, and so here's what the words are, the two words are that come together. They're the word hallel, okay? Uh, the Hebrew word hallel means to lift up or praise, right, extol. And it has a suffix on it, on the end of the word, it's got the suffix u. So it's hallel u, okay? And that suffix u is like uh, a third person uh, uh, plural, uh, really. So it would mean this, everyone, okay? Uh, praise everyone, hallelu. And then the last word or the last part, three words that come together is the word Yah, okay? Which is, a, let's say, a contraction on the name Yahweh, okay? So together those words make this word that you know in Hebrew, hallelujah. Catch that? What word is that in English? Yeah, that's exactly right. Or if you're in the South, it's hallelujah, right? But uh, it's uh, hallelujah. And what hallelujah literally means in the Hebrew language is praise you the Lord. And so all of them have that thought, that theme, and most of them that phrase. And they were songs that were used together at these great feasts to praise the Lord. They were called Hallel Psalms. They would be sung responsively, responsive singing. Does everybody know what I mean? Uh, i got to be careful not to go out of the camera. When I say responsive singing... We know what responsive reading is, right? If I said, let's read the 113th uh, Psalm responsively, I'll read the first verse, then you'd read the second, and I'd read the third, right? Well, these psalms were used in the great festivals, and they sung them, they sang them uh, responsively. Has anybody ever done that? Nobody? So I, I, I promise you, every one of you has. Someone tell me a song that you've sung responsively. You're exactly right, madam. Uh, give that woman some candy. Uh, wait, we don't have any. But uh, uh, she gets a prize. In fact, it's from this psalm or set of psalms. 
And we've all sung that, haven't we? Come on, let's, let's try it together, okay? Here we go. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Okay, you guys do the hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. See if they get this. Almost missed it. Hallelujah. 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 Responsive singing, amen. Right out of the word of God. And that's precisely not that exact tune and song, but that's precisely what these songs were and how they were used in the great festivals in the nation of Israel. Now, I want to tell you something else about interesting about them is that course. Uh, that course that we just sang, hallelujah, 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 praise you the Lord. I call it a, uh, we, I call it a, 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 I lost my word, but a, a song that defines something. So, uh, you know, they sing hallelujah, 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 and you might say, what does that mean? And the answer is, praise you the Lord. But here's the really interesting part. I don't know how many languages we've had this course in. In our church that we last pastored, when we last pastored in Idaho, uh, we had a Russian family. We had my wife, who's from Korea. Uh, we had, of course, some Spanish folks. Uh, I don't remember. One time at Vacation Bible School, I believe we had five languages that we sang. I uh, uh, did this at a youth camp one time, and we uh, sang this course in German. We sang this, uh, this song that we just sang in Nepali. All of them, interestingly enough, I know, I know a word in uh, uh, Nepali. You want to hear me speak Nepali? Are you ready? Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Because hallelujah is a word that in every language that I've been able to find so far is not translated, it's simply transliterated, okay? And the, the actual Hebrew word is, is pronounced there, and it's the same everywhere. My wife uh, was told a story one time by some Koreans that I believe was a missionary was coming to where they were at, or they were missionaries and a preacher was coming to the field, I, I don't remember which. And they had gone to the airport to pick him up, but realized that they didn't have the name of the person or know how to contact them. And so what they did, they just knew that that they would know so that when they came off the airplane instead of a sign that says you know uh, Mr. Shang Jiang Hua uh, right the, uh, the person that was looking for him just started doing this hallelujah 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 sure enough the missionary came over they got together and probably went and had a uh, steak or something I don't know but uh, but they did it why because it, this is interesting now I'm not just goofing off with you but hallelujah it seems to be a universal word in every language, you'll find some different accents, right? Or maybe vowels are pronounced a little bit different, ah or a or whatever. But, but hallelujah itself is a word that universally is used. And isn't that interesting? That the God who confounded language would keep at least one word that was for his praise and glory in every language on earth. Now, Coca-Cola tried to imitate it, but let's all admit Pepsi's better. Amen. So it doesn't matter what Coca-Cola did. They still lost the cola wars. And so, uh, listen, this idea of praise, praise ye the Lord, hallelujah, is something very important to God. And I really want to talk to you about it because the 113th uh, Psalm is really instructive on the kind of praise, now listen to what I'm going to tell you, that God expects from and commands to be given by His people. And that's the truth about it. And so if you look at it with me, in verse 1 it says this, Praise ye the Lord. It's the opening phrase. And what I want you to notice about that phrase is, is its punctuation, really. It is just simply a statement, but it is an imperative statement. So it doesn't say in that verse, you might praise the Lord. Or it doesn't say in that verse, when it's possible, praise the Lord. What it says in that phrase in that verse is, praise ye the Lord. It's a directive. Do you understand that? This is not something that God says, hey, listen, I got an idea. If you don't have anything to do on Monday, you could praise the Lord. He said, praise ye the Lord. It's a direct, really, commandment from God. You say, it doesn't say, thus saith the Lord. Well, that's okay. Neither does uh, clean up your room, amen? But we all know it to be an imperative statement, don't we? And one that God expects a response to in obedience uh, to that statement. And so there is a commandment uh, given to God's people to praise the Lord. And he goes on, and this is why I really call it instructive, because he goes on and he begins to describe the kind of praise that God commands and expects 
from his people. So look at it with me, verse 1. Praise ye the Lord, praise, O ye servants of the Lord. And so first of all, there's an imperative or a commandment that says there's an expectation uh, by God uh, to someone that praise be given to him. And in the second phrase, he identifies who the commandment or the expectation applies to. Praise ye the Lord. Now, what's the next phrase? Praise, O ye servants of the Lord. And so God doesn't just tell the entire world, if someone's paying attention, you should praise me. What he says is to a very specific group of people, I'm directing and expect you to praise me. And that very specific group of people are his servants. You say, well, preacher, who are they? Could I tell you that he expects those who have been born into his family, who have come with nothing, deserve nothing, who have come completely by grace, and who ought to be giving our lives as servants to him. His people are his servants. And so when he says, O ye servants of the Lord, he's saying this, that there are a group of people who have been washed in the blood of the Lamb, whose sins have been remitted forever, who have been justified by the legal declaration of God based upon the work of Jesus Christ on Calvary, and I'm telling them that it ought to be normative, normal, and it's expected from their life that they would praise me as their God. Praise ye the Lord, who? Praise, O ye servants of the Lord. Now, you can raise your hand to this tonight if you want to, but I'll ask the question. Uh, who here tonight is born again, washed in the blood of the Lamb? Anybody at all? But here's what this means. All of this applies directly to you and me, doesn't it? That we are the servants who are commanded to praise. The next phrase of 113 says this, Praise ye the Lord. Praise, O ye servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Uh, listen, God is also interested in praise being given specifically to him, okay? That we're to praise him by his name. Praise ye the name of the Lord. That we're to lift up his name. There's no generic God involved in any of this. You sometimes hear people say things like, well, I just want to give honor to the man upstairs. Well, the man upstairs is 85 years old, has bunions and uh, false teeth. No, no, that, that's not, the, the, our God is not the man upstairs, He's to be praised by his name. And can I tell you this, that it's not the hallmark praise, right? Just, uh, you know, the, uh, some higher power praise. In fact, the word uh, Lord there, if you look at it, is the word uh, Yahweh, or uh, uh, right, uh, Jehovah. It's there. It's by his name. And do you understand that for us today in the New Testament, while uh, the Lord here is always Jehovah, but here's his name. Here's the name of Jehovah in the New Testament. It's Jesus Christ. He's Jehovah in the New Testament. And we're to give praise. We're to give this, this extolling honor, lift up the name of Jesus Christ, who is those who are the servants of God through Jesus Christ are commanded to praise. And so it's very specific that there's a commandment to praise, but it's just not uh, you know, a shotgun blast thrown out there uh, for anybody who catches it. But he says, listen, you should lean in and pay attention to this, that if you're a blood-bought child of the king, there's an expectation that you would name in a way that magnifies the name and the person, the one who redeemed you from your sin, amen? The one who gave it all and gives you life and life abundantly in Jesus Christ. There is a commandment very specifically to praise a specific God by his name and to come from a specific people tonight. Is everybody with me here? And it's pretty instructive and direct. Look what else it says here, though, in the psalm. It says this, Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. It's more instruction on the kind of praise we're to give. We're commanded to praise. Servants are commanded to praise. We're just going to say that as we from now on, okay? And they're commanded to give him praise by his name. But I want you to notice this, that there is a distinct starting point in their life of this praise, and there is no ending point. It says, <coughs> pardon me, in verse 2, again, blessed be the name of the Lord. That's the praise being given to his name. From this time forth, and how long? forevermore. That means that there's supposed to come a time in your life when you uh, enter into a relationship, you recognize him as the God he is, he gave his life to redeem you, and you hear his commandment to praise, and that that would start something in his life. 
From this point forth and for all the rest of the days that you exist, God expects praise to be coming from your life and from mine. There's a definite starting point in days and no ending point. In other words, it's to be praise that starts and never ends. Look at verse 3. From the rising of the sun unto the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. So uh, not only does he say that there ought to be a starting point in your life uh, when you become a servant of God, when you're born again and enter into a relationship with him forevermore, but that each of those days is to be, can I say it this way, marked by praise, okay? So from the rising of the sun unto the going down of the same. There's really two things that I'd like you to see about that. The first one is remember that the people that are being written to are primarily an agricultural society. And they primarily uh, began their days with the rising of the sun and ended their days with the going down of the same. That's the way that it worked. And so he's literally saying this from the time you get up in the morning until the time you go to bed at night, there is an expectation from God that you, his servants, would lift up and praise his name uh, beginning on the day you become a servant and become aware of this forevermore, all day, every day, the substance of your life is to be marked by praise amen there's another thought there though the other thing that would be in view of the rising of the sun to the going down of the same is literally from horizon to horizon and so there's no place on the face of the earth no time of day on the place of the earth that there's not an expectation from god that his blood-bought servants would not be giving him praise by his name it's praise praise you the lord who praise all you servants of the lord how praise you the name of the lord when from this day forth and forevermore what time from the beginning of the day unto the end your words and your life are to lift up your god that's the commandment of praise from god Now let's agree on something. That's a whole lot of praise. Isn't it? I mean, your life, since you've been born again, if you and I have been obedient to this, should be marked by praise to God. I guess I would pause there for a moment because I know us today, and I'm convinced that in the year 2020, Christians' lives are more marked by COVID-19 than they are by praise to God. We're more upset about masks than we are excited about our God. Now, I hate masks too. But I sure don't want them to be the substance from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same every day. I don't want the troubles in my nation. I don't want the foolishness that I think is going on to mark my life. I want my life to be marked by praise given to God. I want it to be what I'm known for and what you're known for. I want it to be known that's part, I believe, of shining the light. That no matter what, the name of God is extolled here. That it is lifted up. And that there's never a moment that we become so fixated on circumstances, either good or bad, that we somehow forget about our God and stop praising Him to focus on those circumstances. Because the commandment of God is robust. And it calls for robust praise from His people And there are those who might say this, maybe none in this room tonight, but there certainly are those. Hey, hold on a minute. That's just a little bit excessive. I think it's just a little bit fanatical that you would expect that every part of my life is to be marked constantly by praise to God. It would mean both in words, in attitude or countenance, and in deed, right? It doesn't mean that you and I are to walk around with vain repetition and, uh, you know, uh, every three seconds go, oh, ding, 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 praise you the Lord. Oh, ding, ding, no. It means that everything about our life ought to be pointing to and lifting up our God, including our words, amen? And you'd say, preacher, that's an awful lot of praise. And I agree with you. That's a lot of praise. It's a robust volume of praise that should be coming. I mean, I want you to think about, I want you to think about the volume of praise uh, to God, the extolling that God would get if simply everyone present in this building tonight lived by this imperative of God. Would it be different than what he gets now? Would it be different in the circles that you run in, what they think about your God already? And, and listen, it's just what he does. 
So the question is not, is that a, a lot of praise or is that too much praise? The question is, is he worthy of that much praise? Because his commandment is to a lot of praise. Now I know that our default answer is he is worthy of that kind of praise. But this psalm goes on and really describes for us in some interesting ways why this is not only appropriate, but it ought to be the passion of our heart uh, to give this kind of praise to our God. And notice what it says in verse 4. And it really makes a transition from the imperative to the worthiness of God for this kind of praise. And in verse 4 it says, <clears throat> excuse me, the Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. Now there's two different things that are in view there in two different statements. And the first one is, is that the Lord is high above all nations. This statement is a statement of the sovereignty of God. Okay, this is not a statement of his size. This is a statement of his being or his sovereignty, his authority. And here's what it says, that he's high above all nations. So this nation has this much sovereignty and God's sovereignty, the Lord is high above all nations. Whatever their sovereignty is, whatever America's sovereignty is, he is high above that. So it's not close. He ekes it out, right? I mean, he is, uh, he is far beyond the sovereignty of any nation. But it's interesting here that he doesn't say he is high above any nation. It says he's high above all nations. And here's what it says, that our God is so sovereign, that our God is the one who has the only one who has the right and the ability to be sovereign over everything that exists anywhere ever, right? That he's high above all combined sovereignties. That's what that verse says. If you took all sovereign entities on the face of this planet, if you took every nation uh, that's a sovereign nation and you, and you piled them together, you joined them together, and so you took all of their authority, all of their power in this world, all of their sovereignty in this world, and you made it into one big nation with one worldwide sovereignty, here's what it says. It would be nothing but a speed bump compared to the sovereignty of God. Our God is high above all nations. I want to tell you that there's a prince of the power of the air tonight who is accountable to the God who's sovereign above all nations. I want to tell you tonight that the most vile, rebellious sinner who shakes his fist at God and denies him has the free will to do that and maybe the political freedom to do that but at the end of the day he will stand uh, frankly he will kneel and bow before a sovereign God because there'll be no place there's no place of refuge outside of that there's no place to go and say I disagree with what God said I'd like to have you overturn that decision you can't take God to the Supreme Court there is no sovereignty that is even in the ballpark compared to the sovereignty of God. Listen to this. Praise ye the Lord. Praise, O ye servants of the Lord. Praise ye the name of the Lord. From this day forth and forevermore, praise ye the Lord. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, praise ye the Lord. Why? Because our God is an all-sovereign God. Because our God's decision can't be overturned. Because our God's judgments and commandments and, uh, uh, and uh, edicts can never be overruled. How many of you are glad about that tonight? And let me make sure you understand why you are. Because you were saved tonight by the judgment and declaration of God into your life based upon the work of Jesus Christ. Justification is an act why God, where, whereby God legal, legally at the bar of eternal justice declares you to be not guilty of sin and to be perfectly holy with the righteousness of God. And he does that based upon the work of Jesus Christ applied to your life. But aren't you glad he's a sovereign God? Because there is also an accuser of the brethren that says, do you know that Rodney Woodcock guy? He's really not all that you think he is. But my God is sovereign. And when he justified me, there's nothing that can change that ever because he is high above all sovereign entities that have ever or ever will exist. It not only says that he's sovereign, but I want you to look at the second phrase. It says the Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. And glory here is this idea. It's the, let's just say the manifest presence or the, or the, or the substance of the presence of God. Glory. The heavens declare the glory of God. What do they declare? That our God is 
and that he is a magnificent, creative uh, uh, a God who's able to create things beyond our imaginations. They declare the, the glory of God. The firmament showeth his handiwork. He's a God who is never without a solution to every wonderful thing that could ever come along. And when it says that his glories fill the heavens, it's talking about the literal heavens, or, or that are above the heavens, pardon me. And so I got to thinking about this, and, uh, and you know that, uh, that in order, or maybe you don't know, but I'll tell you, that in order for God's glory or the manifestation of his presence to be uh, above the heavens, you understand that it can't simply be a, a linear um, thing. It can't just be a tall column, if you will. Why? Well, because the heavens are volumetric. Does that make sense to everybody? Uh, the heavens are not linear, are they, right? So if the heavens were linear and this worked that way, see how I stayed on the camera? Uh, uh, this is what would happen. You would go walking across the face of the earth until you came to the point where the heavens ceased, right? And you would still be on the face of the earth, but you would not have any atmosphere. Why? Well, because the heavens as the Bible describes them, are volumetric. They're not linear, okay? They're volumetric. In other words, they fill things. And the Bible does describe three heavens, doesn't it? It describes the first heaven, which is, uh, we'll just say, our atmosphere, right? Birds fly in it, airplanes go in it, all those kind of things. You breathe that, amen? I'm glad to get a little bit of heaven into my lungs every once in a while, amen? I understand. I'm not being facetious by that. I'm just telling you that the Bible describes that as the first heaven. And then it describes the second heaven. And the second heaven is really outer space, and the third heaven, uh, we learn of from Paul's writings. It's that place where God abides, where the throne room of God is at, that he was caught up into the third heaven. Uh, the Bible says he knew a man one day, whether in the spirit or out, uh, that was caught up into the third heaven. So there are heavens, the Bible describes, but they are volumetric. And so here's what it means, that in order for God to be above the first heaven, okay, he's got to be above it in every point, doesn't he? He can't not fill it to overflowing or be above it in any point because if he did, he, he, I mean, it wouldn't work. He wouldn't be above the heavens there. So that means that the, that the manifestation or the presence of God uh, is, is got to be so vast that it doesn't reach above them in a straight line, but that it fills our atmosphere to overflowing. Is everybody with me here? And then the second heaven, which is outer space. Ooh. I was uh, I was given a picture one time as a book was brought to me in a meeting that I was in and and uh, it was it was one of those big books I, I don't know the right name for them. I call them time life books. I don't know if that's right, but you can buy them in the bookstores. They're usually like five ninety nine because nobody ever. I mean, they buy them, give them to their grandkids, and then they're in a yard sale type of things. You know, tanks of the world, birds of prey. Well, this one was on on planets and stars and stuff, and it's it's big. You know, they're they're like this tall and they're like I don't know this wide, and you open them up, it's sort of like opening up the family Bible sort of deal. You know, and uh, and uh, the guy brought it to me, and on this page of that, uh, the entire Entire page, uh, except for just a very thin white border around all four sides, the entire page was was a star field. Does everybody understand what I mean? It would be like you went out away from the city and you, on a dark, clear night, and you laid down. Have you ever done this? And looked up in the sky, and the stars are just there, and you're like, "Whoa!" That's what it looked like, right? I mean, it's just black and immense, and and then just points of light, big ones, little ones, right? All of this, and it was this. It was this. That's what it was. It was a big star field. And in the middle of the star field, there was a, a red arrow. It was about that long and, and uh, stood out there. And it was a red arrow. And it pointed to a little bitty dot of light in the middle of that star field. I mean, it was so little that if the arrow wasn't there pointing it out, you wouldn't have even noticed. I mean, it would have not even stood out at all. You wouldn't have been able to, uh, to perceive that it was really there. You'd have to really look to do that. And this red arrow uh, had a caption on it that told us what it was pointing to. Anybody want to guess? What's that? No, no, no. Well, you're all right, but you're also all wrong. It was pointing to the Milky Way. So you understand that we're one of the smaller planets in the Milky Way. The Milky Way is our galaxy. And in this great 
in this great star field, whatever you want to call it, the Milky Way that has in it a little planet called Earth, and in that a little continent called America, and in that really a rather little state called Pennsylvania that you're in is nothing more than an imperceptible spot. You want to know what's cool? That picture wasn't of all of the third heavens. That picture was a picture from the Hubble Space Telescope. And it was a part of a panoramic set of photos. And so the Hubble Space Telescope works like this, or worked. It took a picture, turned, took a picture, turned, took a picture, turned, took a picture, did that, and then went up to the next level, turned, took a picture, turned, took a picture, turned, you get that? And then they would stitch them together. And it was one of those slices of the panorama of the third heavens was this picture on this page. And the imperceptible spot in a very small slice of the second heaven is the galaxy that we live in. Now, why am I telling you that? Because our God is high above all nations and his glory is above the heavens. And the heavens are volumetric. And he fills the first heaven with the glory of his presence. And he fills the immeasurable, unexplorable expanse of outer space with the wonderful manifestation of his glory, his presence. And therefore, the Bible says, the heavens declare the glory of God. Why? Because our God is so immense and his glory so, uh, so indescribable, so, uh, uh, is so huge, so, uh, so vast that the universe that he created, I mean, all of the created universe cannot hold in the glory of our God. It is filled to overflowing by him. So just like like the atmosphere, no matter where you go on planet Earth, you get to breathe the atmosphere, amen? No matter where you go on planet Earth, no matter where you go in this galaxy, no matter where you go in this universe, no matter where you would go in any place that anyone could ever go at any time ever, the presence and manifest glory of God would be there because we serve an immense God. His sovereignty is high above all nations. His being, his presence, his person is immense beyond all measure. And in fact, the psalmist gets uh, uh, very excited about that. In verse 5, he asks a question who, which is really rhetorical and transitional. And he says this, who is like unto the Lord our God? Anybody want to answer that tonight? There is none like the Lord our God. Amen. And he says, who is like the Lord our God who dwelleth uh, on high? And so he talks about this God. I mean, it's, it's spectacular. And he says, let me tell you why he's worthy of praise. Because of who he is. Because our God is sovereign above all sovereigns. And our God is immense beyond any measure. That, that there's no place. I mean, this ought to be uh, exciting and comfortable to you tonight and comforting to you tonight. That there's no place or no thing. There's no dark valley. There's no high mountain. There's, uh, there's no bad neighborhood. There's no good neighborhood. There's nowhere you can go without being there uh, really within the grasp, immersed in uh, the really manifest presence of our God. He is everywhere because he is immense and fills all creation to overflowing. And it also says that he dwells on high. Well, let me tell you why this praise is so robust, it's commanded, because of who our God is, amen. But he doesn't stop there, because he also says this in the next verse. Here's this all-powerful, all-sovereign, immense God who dwells on high, there's none like him, verse 6, who humbleth himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in the earth. That word humbleth there is the word, uh, let's say it's like the word stooped down or lowered himself. If you were to humble yourself before God, you might prostrate, your, prostrate yourself on the ground. That's that word. But God didn't do that because there's a greater power. God did that because there's a needy people. 
And what it says here is you've got this, this all-sovereign, uh, immense, unique God who literally gets down on his hands and knees to observe what's going on amongst men. Who humbled himself to behold the things that are in heaven and the earth. And the next verse tells us that when he did that, when he's represented as doing that, that what he found out was that mankind, who he created in his image, were in desperate, filthy condition. That they were dwelling among, verse 7, the dust and the dunghills of life. That their lives that had been created in the perfect image and likeness of God had been, had been tainted and defiled and, uh, and made filthy by sin. And God literally got down. You know, let me give you a picture of that getting down on his knees. How many of you remember uh, something called hard contacts? You remember those? They, now they have soft contacts. You throw them away. Remember the hard ones? They cost like $300 a piece or something like that. And they were made out of hard glass. Everybody remember those? I know I can say that here. If I say that at youth camp, they go like this. Uh, but I can say that here because, well, you're old. And uh, that's just the way that goes. You can remember it. I say those were the most powerful things in the, in the world at times. State uh, championship basketball game, 10 seconds left, score tied, home team gets the ball, they're dribbling down the floor. It's going to be a certain layup. Ah! Somebody yells this, contact! And everybody stops in place. You've seen it happen. And they all get down on the floor and they... I mean, literally, they get, uh, I'm going to get off the camera, sorry. Uh, but uh, they, they literally get down on the floor like this, right? And they're doing this. Everybody's doing this until someone goes, I, I got it. And the guy that lost it, you know, he goes, oh, thank you. And sticks it back in his eye, and they're like, play ball. Pretty powerful stuff. Pretty powerful stuff. That's the stooping. It's like looking for that needle in a haystack. That close scrutiny because there's something you need and want to know. And what he found is us in terrible condition, bound in chains of sin and darkness, dead to God, our creator. And look what it says. He humbleth himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in the earth. He raiseth up the poor out of the dust and lifteth the needy out of the dunghill that he may set him with princes, even with the princes of his people. Did you catch that? God stooped down to where you and I are at, and he found us in a, in a disgusting mess. And he reached out his hand and said, if you want out of there, I can solve your problem. And when you reach back for his, he took you, and he didn't take you out of the dust pile, and he didn't take you out of the dunghill and set you on the side and say, now don't mess this up, boy. It says that he took you and set you among the princes of his people. That he completely changed who you are and your future. He changed everything about it. Your expectation or hope is now eternity in heaven with him because God, this all-powerful, all-sovereign, uh, all-glorious, immense God, uh, humbled himself and got down and saw us in the condition we are and reached out for us. And when we reached back in faith, he took us and he set us in a place where that will never be our nature again and it can never bind us again and we can even mess up like old Hogan's goat, and we will never end up bound in the dust piles and dunghills of life again. It'll never happen again because of who our God is and what he does. Because God changes us in our life for all of eternity. We are, we are kings and priests unto the Lord our God in Jesus Christ. We are adopted. We are given the adoption. We are joint heirs with Jesus Christ because of what he did for us. He changes our forever. Hallelujah. But he doesn't stop there. 
Because he goes on and says this in verse 8, or verse 9. He maketh the barren woman to keep house and to be a joyful mother of children. Praise ye the Lord. Now, let me make sure that your expectations are right. It is true that there are people, women, who have been barren and never had children. What this is talking about is how God so often intervenes, not only in our eternity, but in our present life. Jesus said, I'm come that you might have life out of the dust piles and dung hills and have it more abundantly, a transformation in your present life. And what God does when he, when he uh, saves us is also begin to transform us into the image of his dear son. And that's shown here by a very interesting testimony. And it's the testimony, really, of these last uh, about uh, three verses uh, are, are the testimony that was given by Hannah in the book of 1 Samuel. Because, in fact, uh, verses 7 and 8 uh, are direct quotes from the song of praise of Hannah in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 2 when she had taken her son and given him back to the Lord and, uh, and that her son was now uh, there and, and she sings this song of praise and says, let me tell you about my God. My God changes lives. My God uh, meets the world and lifts them up and sets them amongst the princes of his people, it says. Let me tell you about God. But let me tell you what else he did. He made me have a son. Hannah's testimony. And she got on her knees up there at that great festival, so much so that Eli the priest thought that she was drunk. She poured out her heart to God. She begged God. She, she was overwhelmed with the potential of God. She said, God, just anything that you give me a child. And God did. And God gave her more. And it changed her now. See, we serve a God who's not only interested in your forever, but he's interested in your today. And he's willing to transform you in this life today. You know, he wants to take you. I mean, think about the magnitude of this. We serve a God that's so sovereign and so immense that he wants to take you not only out of dust piles and dung hills, but he wants to use you as his ambassador to the people of this neighborhood. See, God is stooping down into this neighborhood today through you. He's stooping down in this community today through you carrying the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have a God who is worthy of immense praise because of who he is and because of what he does. It's not only appropriate, but it's minimalistic. The praise that we're commanded to give to God should not be something that we look at and wonder if it's too much. It should be something that we look at and realize that it is insufficient and that he is worthy of far more than every day of my life and every hour of my day could ever offer up to him. And in the midst of all of that, he's in the business of changing me into the wonderful image of his dear son. And the psalm ends appropriately. Praise ye the Lord. One of the surest ways to hide your light is to hide your Savior. to not lift him up and praise him. The psalmist writes in another place, oh, magnify the Lord with me. You know, a magnifying glass doesn't make anything bigger, does it? You know, you stick it on the ant, and the ant that was just down there little, you look at it and you go, whoa! And then you hold it there and you go, <laughs> sorry, ant, you burnt up. Uh, the ant doesn't get bigger. He just looks bigger. He's seen as bigger. When it talks about magnifying the God, we can't make a God bigger. His glory fills the heavens. But we can sure show how big he is by the praise we offer 
with our life and our lips. And it is a commandment to which we will be accountable for how we have magnified him through praise because it is unarguable tonight that we couldn't have designed a God more worthy than the one who designed us. He is worthy of overwhelmingly immense praise. That is really not the question. The question is, does he get it from you? That's the question. Does this God, our God, your Redeemer, by his name, from now and forever, throughout the waking hours of your life, wherever you might be on the face of this planet, does he get this praise that he's worthy of from your life? You could start tonight. This time, and I'm going to pray and close in a moment, but I'm going to tell you that it ought to be a time, I believe, when we acknowledge our God and his wonder, and maybe we bow before him whether physically if we're able, but certainly in our hearts, and that we would bow before him tonight in this room before we leave. We would remember how wonderful he is. We would remember that he had every right and ability to forget about us and start over. And that we would just bow ourselves down and praise him, thank him, and maybe even ask him to forgive us for the number of times that this phenomenal, immense, sovereign God has just become routine in our life and received nothing from which he's worthy from us. Maybe tonight we begin with confession. And maybe tonight we then move to acknowledgement that there's no reason that exists not to give him the praise he commands And then we move maybe to commitment and ask God to give us grace to give him the praise he's worthy of from our life by showing and declaring him to a darkened, lost world. This is a night to be changed because of who our God is and what he does. Let's stand together. Heads bowed and eyes closed. I'm going to have a word of prayer and your pastor will come. Maybe you need to come to an altar tonight. I don't know. I don't know what your traditions or norms are. Don't really care too much. I don't mean that to be offensive. I just mean that maybe it's time we got our face before God and refreshed our journey and our perspective of Him. Whatever it takes to do that tonight, I'd invite you to do it even as I pray. Father, I love you and I'm so thankful that you stooped down. I'm thankful that you reached out to a toe-headed little boy in a little nowhere place in the middle of Montana. And you raised him up. You washed away his sin. You wrote his name in the Lamb's Book of Life and you set him among the princes of your people. And you change and inhabit every day of his life. God, I acknowledge you tonight as worthy. But far more than that, I acknowledge that I've too often failed to praise you. And I commit before you and all of these dear folk that from my life, it is my intention, desire, and pursuit to give you the praise that you're worthy of from this day forth and forevermore. Oh, God, help us tonight to set in your presence in awe of you, even broken and humbling ourselves before you. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Rodney, I, if, you're, if the Lord hasn't spoken to your heart tonight, you know, there's definitely something wrong. God uh, 
God is worthy to be praised, and we, he is an awesome God. And uh, we are nothing before him, but praise the Lord, he has made us his children. Uh, let's, uh, let's close with a word of prayer tonight. Oh, our gracious Heavenly Father, I do thank you for Brother Rodney and his ministry. And uh, Lord, <clears throat> we need to come to the altar. We need to come before you, as Brother Rodney said, acknowledging that, Lord, we do fail. We don't praise you the way we ought to praise you. We get worried. We get concerned. We, Lord, we fear. And instead of recognizing that, Lord, you are high above, all nations. Lord, you pulled us out of the miry clay. You pulled us out of the dunghill, out of the dust, and set us up as princes. And Lord, I thank you for that. So Lord, I pray as we go from this place, we would let your praises be known to the world around us. From morning to evening, from this point, forevermore. Lord, I do thank you in Christ Jesus' name. Be with us now. Use us this week. We thank you in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Um, thank you for being here with us tonight. You may be dismissed. <clears throat>